very special guy, Steve Wheeler. I've been following him for actually for several years, and he has the most amazing talks and presentations, and of course research and so on. And basically, he's going to talk about social media and mobile technology, learning in the digital age. Okay, Steve Wheeler is associate professor of learning technologies at Plymouth University in Southwest England. He's originally trained as a psychologist, just like me, and he has spent his entire career working in media technology and learning, predominantly nurse education from 1981 to 95, and that's so hopefully we can get some insights into that, and also involved in teacher education and training from 1976 to 1981, and also then after the nurse education continued from 1995 until present. He is now in the Faculty of Health, Education and Society. Uh, a trained educator, he teaches on a number of undergraduate and postgraduate teacher education programs. He specializes in research on learning and distant education with a particular emphasis on social media and web 2 tools he is he is regularly invited to speak about his work and has given keynotes and invited lectures to audience in over 20 countries across five continents okay he is currently involved in several research programs related to e-learning social media and handheld technologies he is author of more than 150 scholarly articles and is an active blogger, active and prolific blogger, edu blogger. His blog, Learning with E, which I will share the URL soon, is a regular online commentary on the social and cultural impact of disruptive technologies and the application of digital media in education and training. And I can go on, but I stop there. I'll share with you the link about more about him. And I don't want to take up so much time. I'll be in the chat box. Uh, uh, listening to the discussion and being so on and we're going to give him his time you can, you can take your time our webinars have a start time does not have an end time so you're welcome to go on and we are ready to rock and roll and Steve Miller here you are and I'm going to switch off myself if anything I'll pop up okay thank you very much <laughs> hello again everyone um, well, we'll join. Uh, this is learning in the digital age uh, and, and um, go wrong with some things technology allows to be in several places when the distance of words and a fab idea. I was saying before that this picture was taken in a square in the middle of the Czech Republic a few weeks ago when I was over there teaching. So we physically to do a week and um, and I thought this is quite a fabulous picture because it, it, it shows me walking along this old cobbled street but I'm using a mobile device to capture that and, and um, it, it's quite incredible how much we can capture these days with just you know, the device in our hand. You know, the sound, you know, videos, pictures, uh, we can mo-blog, we can mobile blog as well, we can, we can write about what we're hap what's happening to us as it's happening to us uh, wherever we are in the world and I think that's a fabulous um, concept. And uh, so the idea of, um, of this webinar is that, is that I'm going to look at the, these, these things with you. Um, if I can um, advance the slide. Um, I don't know whether I can advance the slide actually on this one though because I think you've taken away my admin rights as well but let's see. Um, no, I, I think um, maybe, um, here we are, thank you, um, Zaid, now I have, I have access now. Um, here, here are the four things that I'd like to try and cover with you um, uh, today, uh, particularly the idea of informal learning, because um, as Jay Cross and people like Clover and others have said, um, around about 80% of what we learn is, is informal, it's outside the main classroom, it's outside formal education and that's um, quite a staggering statistic you know four-fifths of what we learn you know are with people that we know who are outside of education so going down to the you know the pub or you know going to a restaurant or going out for a coffee or just walking around or sitting and watching the television you know we're learning all the time and um, social media is going to play an increasingly important role in all that and um, other things like integrating smart devices into into um, our environment is also going to be important for the future. Uh, I'll try and talk about the, the pedagogy and the psychology of this because that's what I'm, I'm, I'm currently interested in. That, in fact, that's been my whole life of research has been around those areas. So I'll try and deal with that with you. And some of the research issues as well, for those of you who are into, um, into looking at the hard science of, of, of these areas. Um, but um, we have to be interested in the future. We have to be interested in what's coming next because we don't know what's coming next but we have to prepare for it and that's a very difficult tension when you when you're preparing young people for a world of work that you can't clearly describe yet as David Warlock once said so when this um, mayor in, in 
the, the Midwest of America saw Alexander Graham Bell's demonstrated for the first time. He was really excited about it, and he shouted out, one day every town in America will have one of these. And um, he was right, but he was wrong as well, because obviously, although every town in America does have a telephone, just about everybody in America also has a telephone in their pocket, or, or even more than one device. And those telephones do other things, like take pictures and connect to the internet. Now, he couldn't foresee that. It was a very narrow vision, whereas what we have to do is try and broaden our perspective. And of course, we can't do that because we really don't know what's coming next. But what we can do is we can predict some of the trends. You know, the, 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 these um, the from the past who have tried to, to say what they think the future is are laughable. Um, this one here was a hidden agenda. This guy was interested in pushing the idea that hand-delivered mail was going to be the future. Of course, technology comes in and it disrupts everything that we know. And when it's that disruptive, and that kind of that much of a paradigm shift, we have to adapt quickly to it. And of course, you're going to get people lagging behind. We're going to get lots of people standing there, bewildered, and saying, "You know, what do we do next?" And, and, and I'm sure you've got colleagues like that. And we have to kind of um, try and manage this process if we're introducing new technologies, whether it's in education or in health or, or, or wherever. So, I think that's quite an important thing for us to consider: the idea that there's going to to be differential between people's perceptions and the reality. Uh, having, here are some of the trends that I've noticed over the past, um, I don't know, 30 years or so. Um, in in around about 1989, I think it was, uh, multimedia started to really uh, become a big thing in education. And, and uh, I was involved in implementing it at the time in, in nurse education and in health education. And uh, we used a lot of video, we used a lot of audio, we, we put it together with um, various imagery and so on, and, and um, we were using 16 millimeter film, and, and, and video was kind of becoming quite a big thing in them days as well. So the idea was to try and introduce it so that you could integrate it into the classroom and, and, and make it a seamless provision. And in 1999, I was in a, a Berlin conference, a conference uh, called Online Educa, and I was on a panel and I was sat beside a guy from MIT and another guy on the other side from another university. And the three of us were supposedly the three wise men. And they were asking us questions about what we thought the future was. And it came to my turn. And I said, I think the future is going to be the web. I think everything is going to converge upon the web. Now, fortunately, I, I took a gamble. And fortunately, I was correct because I could see the trends. And I could see how everything was converging. And, and what we've got now is, is the idea that the web is changing everything. It's a game changer. But things are moving on faster than that, and we have to look again to the future. So um, I'm saying not to be smart mobile. I think um, it's not just going to be the web. Everything from multimedia and the web is now contained in smart mobile technology. So that's going to be the next phase, I think, my kind of um, gambit on, on, you know, on, on the future. And um, hopefully what we're seeing now in these trends is, is, is that it's happening. And, and that's an exciting thing for us to think about as educators. And um, here's the first mobile phone. Um, I, I do this with a straight face. It's actually two mobile phones. Uh, here's and hers, if you like. You know, um, uh, but it's, it's essentially, um, the, the, the idea um, behind the real mobile phone, this, this is Mal Malcolm Cooper, who actually designed the first mobile phone, was that it was huge. But it was still mobile. You could still walk around with it. You had to have muscles like a, an ox, you know, to carry it. They, they called it the brick because it looked like one. You could probably build a house with enough of them. Um, but the thing was that um, it was the it was the first untethered device that could be used to communicate with. Um, there were previous untethered devices, which I'll talk about in a moment. But the idea was that multimedia brought the world into the classroom, but smart technologies are going to take the classroom back out into the world again. We're going to become much more ambient. We're going to become much more itinerant, much more mobile, and much more um, uh, out there in the environment, moving around, learning in lots of different contexts now. I think that's going to be what we have to prepare for and what we have to prepare our, our young people for when they're coming into higher and further education. So that's my vision for the future. Here are some of the devices I mentioned. On the right-hand side, there was the first mobile device, courtesy of um, Gutenberg's Press. Um, the, mobile, you know, the mobile book, you know, the idea that books were no longer chained to a wall in a library, and that they could be movable, they could be moved around, you could walk around with them and, and lay them on a desk or sit down with them and read anywhere in a park or in your own house, I think was quite a revolutionary idea back all those hundreds of years ago. Um, 
since then, obviously, we've got electronics. So you've got laptops, you've got Kindle e-book readers, you've got iPads, you've got iPod touches, iPhones, you name it. These smart mobile devices are actually um, changing the way we consume and create and share and organize data and information and knowledge in that order. And uh, Mark Curtis makes a really important, profound statement here that we're becoming distributed beings. We have to look at the idea now that everything that we do is becoming more distributed. And I'm not just talking about distributed in terms of where we go. I'm talking about distributed in terms of our cognition, in terms of how we organize and uh, knowledge and how we disseminate it and share it and so on. We are becoming, I suppose, um, a distributed cognitive resource. The whole of humanity is, is connecting constantly with each other. Something like billions on Facebook alone, as you'll see in a moment when I show you some statistics. These are phenomenal exponential times. Ray Kurzweil said that change is not, it's exponential. And that is what we're up against, folks. We're, we're having to run just to stand still. Um, here are some of the incredible statistics. If you stopped the internet for one minute, just for 60 seconds, here's what you'd miss. So let's have a look. We, we'd have something like 600 new videos uploaded to YouTube every minute. Um, something like uh, 1,500 new blog posts every minute. Over 700,000 search queries on Google alone. Forget Bing and all the others for the moment. That, that's just Google. Um, what about um, uh, nearly 200 million emails being sent every minute? What about 100 new LinkedIn accounts? But only one article, see on the right-hand side there, only one new paper-based article is being produced every minute somewhere in the world. That really indicates the trends. Today. And I think we have to pay attention to that and we have to start providing and, and anticipating the future based on these kind of statistics. This infographic I think is really important. And because of that, all that user generated content, it, it, it's because of all this. It's because of this kind of social media use. These are again phenomenal statistics. The one at the bottom, 14 million uh, articles on Wikipedia, I think, I think that in itself is quite interesting um, in dozens and dozens of different languages now and this is again distributed cognition this is people from all over the world coming together and creating this content and refining this content editing it iterating it reiterating it polishing it and, and finally it becomes a resource which is reasonably trustworthy and this is happening in, in all sorts of different social media platforms now so we've got this this huge call it for want of a better expression it's it's not really a global brain, but, it, but it, it, it makes sense to actually think about it in, in those kind of terms. Um, and uh, worldwide ownership of mobile phones is on the increase as well. Look, look at this. This is nearly 6 billion mobile accounts now. Um, I was looking at the world clock today on, on the population, and it currently is still in 70 million people. 7 billion and 70 million people. And there are three or four babies being born every second. Um, that doesn't account for the people who are dying every second. You know, it, it goes above that. So, so um, that could equate to 87% of the population owning a mobile phone. It does not because lots of people have more than one phone. So there are less than 5 billion people in the world with mobile phones, but that's still a huge percentage of the population. I travel to places like um, Western East Africa where there's extreme poverty, where there's no electricity in the schools. And um, children don't even have paper to write on. Um, they learn by singing. And every new thing that they learn, they new, learn a new song for it. But a lot of those have mobile phones, which is incredible. And with those mobile phones, they can find, um, their families can find work. They can find where the best prices are to, um, to sell their goods at the market and so on. They are connected people. You'll see the same in the slums of India. You'll see the same in, in various other parts of the world where there is extreme poverty. People still have these access to these mobile phones, and it's on the increase. So we have to um, pay attention to these kind of um, trends. And uh, mobile game-based learning is also on the rise. Look at, look at these statistics here. Would it surprise you that 53% of gamers are now are female? That's quite an interesting statistic in its own right. And these females are not... Um, you, you know, playing you know pretty pretty games like you'd expect some some females to play. You know, if if you were in, in that kind of mindset, they play the same games as the guys do. 
the shoot 'em up games, yeah, you know, because there's excitement in there, and why shouldn't they? So you know, there's a there's a differential going on here as well. So um, we've got to be careful when we, we when we make these assumptions about gender and and um, preferences and so on. Uh, people are all in this together, and uh, there's an incredible amount of activity going on with social media, with, with um, games, with smart mobile technologies, and so on, across all ethnicities, all genders, all cultures, all society. And it's becoming all pervasive. So what do we do with all that? Well, here's a, an interesting picture that I took in Prague Airport, coming back about three, four weeks ago um, in the Czech Republic. And, and uh, essentially, this is a little lad playing in the airport concourse. They've got free uh, um, Connect uh, devices there for you to play. And um, you can just sit there for, for as long as you want until your flight's called, playing on the Xbox 360 Connect. And there's no device in your hand. You're using your hands to, to gesture, and you're using voice con uh, con connections and so on. And another, um, another trend I, I notice is that everywhere you see these quick response tags, these QR code. Um, uh, tags being um, appearing now on walls and in streets and on posters and so on. You point your camera to it, you take an image of it, and it takes you to a, another website somewhere. So these are like two-dimensional barcodes. They hold an incredible amount of information. And uh, we're going to see these on the rise as well. So there's a lot of, uh, I suppose, trends happening in terms of mobile technology. And our, our job, I suppose, as educators is to try and harness that. Here's an interesting picture which I've enlarged part of. This is Barack Obama um, speaking in Berlin just before he got elected as, um, as the first black president of the United States of America. He was making history, and all the people there are actually holding their hands in the air, and they have a device. There are hundreds and hundreds of people there capturing the moment. And the interest is that although the world's media was there, although there were cameras broadcasting this live by satellite around the world, People who were there were still capturing personal images. They still wanted to capture the image for themselves, who maybe they cared about, a friend or a family member, and say, look, I'm here. Here's a picture of it. I want to show you that I'm here, and I want to share this with you. So the connectivity can also be quite intimate, quite personal as well, as, as, as vastly social. And again, we've got to kind of, uh, kind of understand that and, and comprehend the meaning of that and the significance of that in, in our society today. Um, personal devices and, and, and mobile learning. This is a, an area which I'm, I'm very interested in because um, a lot of universities and colleges around the world are now ha they now have this personalization agenda. We must personalize learning. We must differentiate. We must cater for every need. And of course, some people think that's very difficult to do when, you're, when you have a students that you have to teach. But I just want to show you that there are ways of making uh, learning personal through the use of handheld devices, mobile technology, smart mobile phones, and so on. The idea is that um, we have to acknowledge individual differences today. We can't understand anymore that one size fits all. This is why the virtual learning environment that is institutionally provided is such a big problem. Uh, it's, it homogenizes learning, or it attempts to. It attempts to put everyone in the same box. And you cannot do that today because everyone's different, and we all have different needs, different perceptions, different preferences different options that we want to follow and so on. So how do we do this? How do we create a personalized uh, learning environment? Um, well, if you think about this family that is sat here, um, this is probably about 1955 or, or, or something, um, long before I was born. And, and, <laughs> and what you've got is these four um, people all in the same room, all gathered together. Um, probably in the evening watching the same television channel, because it was probably the only one to watch in them days. Uh, they only probably had one channel to choose from. So they would all watch the same thing, have the same 10 o'clock when the, the little uh, white spot came on and everything blacked out and the test card up. They'd all switch it off and go to bed um, and maybe talk about it the next day. Um, that was then. This is now. We Are Family becomes, we are, and it's the same type of thing. A man and his wife and their two children, a boy and a girl, and they're still gathered around the same television set, but it's a different television set now, <coughs> and it has something different happening because each of them, although they're sharing a social experience, they're also individualizing their social experience because they have a personal item in their set. And that's the secret, I think, to, to personalizing learning within huge social spaces is that if we all have personal handsets, if we all have vote phones, or if we all have 
iPad touches, we can actually personalize the learning experience within, and I'm sure you can think of many, many ways that's happened already or, or ways that you're doing that. So, so um, mobile devices and handheld learning is going to be increasingly important for us in higher and further education. And also, the idea that students are bringing these devices into their classroom now. I spoke in London yesterday at a, at a, a conference, and um, I said to them there, look, it's no good you trying to ban student phones into the classroom. They'll still bring them in anyway, and they will still use them anyway. And what they'll be doing is they'll be checking up on you and what you're saying. They'll be checking up to see if you're accurate, if you're factual, if you're um, plagiarizing or whatever. So you've got to be so careful these days what you say. And so have I. Because students in these devices, even though we ban them or, or maybe try to stop them, why should we do that anyway if it's a gateway to learning? Um, obviously, there are issues like distraction and, 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 um, and wrongful use. But generally speaking, students are very responsible. We should help them to foster and harness these to get their full potential. So the bring your own device movement, or in this case, bring your own multiple devices, BYOMD, is what I see happening now um, in colleges and universities all over the world where I go to speak and also in conferences now. So that's, that's another trend that's happening. And going back to the Xbox 360 Connect, is the future of learning going to be non-touch? Is the future of non-touch? Are we going to be uh, activating computers by waving our hands now? Are we going to be activating computers by voice control soon? Are we going to be you know, um, having the computer look at our facial expression and say, oh, he looks uh, confused there. I'm going to elaborate. You know, these intelligent systems are on their way, and they already exist in terms of um, what Microsoft is doing and, and what various other um, companies like Google are doing. So I'm just wondering, is the future going to be um, non-touch? And Koos, hi Koos, uh, you must be in Holland, are you? Um, Google Glass Project, yeah, I mean, that, that's something that, is going to be released in the next year or so. It's going to be commercially available, and it's going to be um, uh, it's going to augment your reality for you if you wear it um, to a heads-up display, and, and it's going to be quite unobtrusive as well. So that's going to be quite exciting. And we're going to, you know, I, th I think in a few years' time we're going to be sat with our children on our knees, and our children are going to say to us, "Dad, did you really have to touch a computer to make it work?" You know, I think that's going to that's going to happen. Here, here are some of the augmented reality. Um, areas that we can look at. There are two types, I think. First is the phone app, which you can see in front of you there. That's working off um, a, a smartphone with a camera. Through, through the camera, you're seeing the real world, and then you might, for instance, want to know where the nearest uh, railway station is. You point it around, and eventually you will find the direction. Then you, as you move closer to it, the image gets larger, um, and it, it helps you to understand your, your, your geographical location. So there's that type of um, app, but there's also the wearable devices as well, like this one here. And this is a, a, an old device now. It's only about three years old, I suppose, but it's quite old in comparison. It's the Sixth Sense system. If you haven't seen it, have a look at the YouTube videos that are available, and you'll see that it's a combination of cameras, uh, finger caps, projector, mirror, and um, connection into the phone in your pocket through the internet. And what it does is it projects onto any surface and allows you to um, manipulate images or uh, manipulate information. It also allows you to use uh, particular, you know, the, you know, that gesture there, which will allow the, ca the camera to take um, at what you're looking at. So it recognizes these kind of gestures. They're built into the um, the, the algorithms of the system. Have a look at that, and, and and it's really kind of where the web meets the world. It's all these things are possible. All these things are important now, and all these things will be. Um, Kind of written large on the um, higher education agenda in the future, I believe. And uh, yeah, so we mentioned Minority Report. There you are. There's an image from it with um, some overlaid content. It does all those things. And increasingly, I think we're going to be coming. They will um, no longer be new in a few years' time. Um, important thing that we need to remember is, is that these devices are intuitive. Uh, the idea that too much about what you do, you just have to touch or, or swipe or, or pinch or, or, or to the thing work. And this is why the iPad is so um, uh, popular and also so important. It also connects you to a powerful learning network if you've got access to things like Twitter and Facebook and uh, LinkedIn and so on. Because that's where the distributed cognition is that I talked about earlier on. This is where the people are who know the stuff that you need to know. And I think that's also important as well. Uh, there are social issues. There are issues around uh, how people relate to each other, how they receive each other, um, and, and 
and how we um, develop our relationships with each other. And we do live in a social world. Um, Pierre Bourdieu once talked about cultural capital, the idea that this is the, the stuff that sticks society together, helps us the stuff that allows that ethics to know. And Ant talks about digital cultural capital, the digital cultural capital, which is now the idea that we are now beginning to identify ourselves, particularly younger people are identifying themselves through the technologies they use and eventually the technologies they will wear. This is, um, I think, the important thing for us to remember that um, through those those digital mediations, that's how they will be identifying themselves. That's how they add value to their lives and that's to each other. In the future. And my kids are all kind of, two of them are at university now. My, my youngest son is uh, still at college. And the three of those um, live, I suppose, on online. A lot of their time is spent on things like Facebook and, and on their mobile phones, texting away and so on. And, and uh, they look that that's, that's their life. Um, that doesn't preclude them from having face-to-face -face relationships because that's what will happen. That's the default mode, if you like. But when they're away from their friends, they continue to text them and Facebook them and so on. So um, I think we're seeing a new digital cultural capital emerging. And I think that's worth some debate. And uh, Pierre actually says, look, this is, um, this is how we perform publicly now. We, we perform using these mobile tools. That's become the stage upon which we operate. And if you think back to Goffman's work about the front stage, backstage, you know, the dramaturgical model, where in front stage you are managing your impression and at the backstage you are relaxed, then you'll see both these kind of stage roles happening in online and in mobile and social media tools and so on. You'll see people relaxing at one point, and then you'll see them performing at another point. And that is one of the big issues, the big problems with digital identity, is that if you relax at the wrong point, and you show pictures of yourself falling out of a pub at 3 o'clock in the morning, drunk, and then those pictures in three years' time are seen by a potential employer, you've got a problem. They may not even give you an interview. So you've got digital literacy issues. Do you relax or are you managing your impression? Or what's the differential in between? So Goffman's theory is quite an important one, I think, to apprehend. And I might actually blog about that now I said that. More blogging I mentioned earlier on, the idea that you can blog on the move to capture images and sounds and experiences and so on. I think that's equally important. And I think we have to um, I kind of see the potential of this for, for education. And for, you know, for things like reflective practice and for critical blogging in particular is a very, very powerful tool. And it's certainly benefited me down through the ages, you know, through the ages. It sounds like I'm hundreds of years old, but down through the years. Um, I think it's an important kind of um, tool to, to allow us to critically reflect. We've got to think about the social issue of, of, um, of how people intervene or, or, or kind of invade each other's spaces. Um, there was a guy sat on the train next to me coming back last night from London, and uh, he was sh shouting into his phone, I'm on the train! You know, everyone knew he was on the train, and the person who was at the end knew he was on the train, and yet he was shouting down the phone, and everyone was looking at him, you know, quite annoyed, because, in effect, it was noise pollution. He needn't have done that. You know, he, he was, you know, he, I think he was, um, so many people actually do this, they shout into the phone and, and uh, annoy everyone else around them. So I think we have to be a um, particularly sensitive to area. But also, uh, it, it, it's... Um, it, it can disconnect you. You can feel lonely even though you're surrounded by people. And um, mobile technology sometimes has that problem of alienating people. So we've got to be careful. And then the idea you know, of defending your space. You know, um, what about if you're talking confidentially to someone? You know, what are the ethics of that when you're sat on a train or sat on a bus or something and, and um, your people around you are listening to what you're saying? Uh, so we have to think about these, these social issues, and I think there's a lot of research potential there, a lot of, lot of, of um, kind of uh, possibilities and potential areas, and I don't think they've been thoroughly researched by, by a long chalk. There are literacy issues, um, there are questions about whether the language is being dumbed down. Some of my teacher colleagues are saying, oh, texting is such a bad thing because students are now um, writing text speak in their essays and so on. I, I, I've yet to see too much evidence of that. I, I, I don't believe that's true. And, and um, here, here's um, an interesting thing for you to look at here. You can see what this is. This was a competition to write the Lord's Prayer in 160 characters or less, which is the, um, the, the extent of, of, of um, one single text message on SMS. And I think it's quite creative, actually. And, and um, you can imagine someone 
someone um, like David Crystal here, who um, who believes that language is always changing, it's evolving, it's always um, adapting to the to societal trends and, and technology and so on. You can imagine him um, looking at something like that, and, and, and in fact, he said something recently about a, a similar text message, um, which pr was purported to have been an essay. It wasn't, it was a, it was a, a mock, but, but um, it looked like an essay in text speak. And see, he said, I would have given it zero, for grammatical value, but, uh, but 10 out of 10 for creativity. So people are becoming creative, but they're also discerning the difference between texting and, and Facebook speak and, and Twitter language and, and essay formal language. And I think students do know the difference. And if they don't, they should be taught the difference. And then once taught, hopefully they'll never forget it. I think we have to be careful about judging technologies and, and how they damage, you know, supposedly damage our, our language. They don't. They actually make things more valuable and more, more, more kind of um, open and, and creative. And, and one of my colleagues, Pete Yeomans, I quote him often um, on this one. He says, mobile phones are forcing children and young people to become more literate, not less literate. Because without the ability to text, they can't actually fully participate in their own culture. And, and it's important to, to them to do that. But they're also doing other things that they're having to speak in, in, in different way, the, the language to actually express themselves. So, you know, the OMG and, and all these other expressions might not mean a lot to them, but there's a nuance involved in that which does mean something to them. Um, so the abbreviations cease to become abbreviations and become a new, a new context, a new language in its own right. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned before, we have to manage our identity. We have to be careful about whether we're relaxed or, or um, managing our impression in a public space. People forget sometimes that Facebook is open, that Twitter is an online um, open uh, platform which anybody can access if they know where to look. So we've got to be careful what we say and what we do and how, how we represent ourselves, uh, particularly if professional roles. Uh, there are technology issues as well which need researching. Some of these uh, here I, I think are important areas for us to consider. There's also the, um, the contention that, that technologies are neutral. I don't believe that. Richard Clark back in 1996 said that technology is a mere delivery vehicle. It doesn't, de it doesn't decide for you what you, you eat. It, it just delivers the food and then you decide what you eat and what, how you cook it. Which is fine, but that's the wrong, I think, um, it's, it's the wrong analogy really. I, I think uh, Robert Cosmo had it better when he said that um, technologies do have affordances and we have to um, understand that the affordances that each technology has decide on what behavior to a certain extent we use. So a mobile phone, um, there's a way of gripping it and, and, and then you start to use your thumb. Your, 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 your thumbs are actually um, brought into play because it's a natural grasp gesture. And the same thing happens with other technologies like the iPad and so on. So the technology design is actually starting to influence the way we use it. So technologies aren't as neutral as Richard Clark thought they were. And the last word I think goes to Marshall McLuhan on this when he says we actually shape our tools and then afterwards they start to shape us. And I think we've got to be careful because not only will it start to shape the way we use them physically, I think it'll also start to shape the way we use them cognitively. Mind tools as David Jonathan once said, and that means that they will um, start to influence the way we speak, speak and also think as well. So um, I think there are some really key research areas there for somebody to get a PhD out of, and um, if, you, if you can think of any ideas, I'd like to hear from you. Um, lots of uh, research questions there. Um, pedagogy issues, well, I think um, some of these issues here have been identified. If you're going to implement any type of mobile learning or, or, or personalized handheld devices, you've got to look at the design of the devising system in front of you. Um, keep it simple, but keep it smart, and make sure that it's um, accessible at, you know, uh, at the point of delivery. Make sure that it's in the context it should be in. These, I think these are important design issues for, for, for good pedagogy. And uh, I'd like to use Alec Kier slide. I think he's in Australia at the moment. If, you, if he's um, listening to this later on, then thank you, Alex, for um, <laughs> Alex for uh, help, you know, helping with these slides. Um, this is, I think, one of his kids, and, and uh, kids are actually sharing a lot of their content now online. It, it's what they tend to do. They, they become the nodes of their own production. I think this is the, the trend that we're seeing with young people's learning these days. And if you put all this together, how they consume and how they um, 
uh, you know, actually uh, create and how they share and how they remix. The end of the cycle, I think you all agree with me that learning is changing. The idea that um, we would learn from a, a knowledgeable other is now just one of the possibilities. There are lots of other ones as well. And I think we're having to start to revise our theories as well as a result of that. So lots of theories coming in. Um, new ones, which I'm blogging about at the moment. So go to my blog and read about those if you want to know more. Um, George Siemens, Stephen Downs, various other people in, in Canada and in other parts of the world are now thinking about this idea of connectivism, this idea that um, we need a new theory for the digital age. I'm not sure whether that's actually a theory or not. It's still, the jury's still out on it. But one thing I do like the idea of is that we're seeing the community now becoming the curriculum. We are deciding for ourselves what we want to learn and how we want to learn it. And I think um, colleges and universities have to start acknowledging that fact that students are paying large amounts of money to get their education now. And, and I think they need more autonomy. They need to be given more agency to decide how they want to learn and, and what they want to learn to a certain extent. So in fact, the community becomes the curriculum. And these communities of practice that Wenger and Leif talked about all those years ago are starting to coalesce around social media. They are starting to coalesce around mo mobile technologies. And we are beginning to become a new type of distributed community, distributed cognition through that community, which means that we start to, as Karen Stevenson said, we start to share our knowledge with our friends. And we start to store our knowledge with our friends. And we start to access our knowledge through our friends. So we don't need to know everything anymore. We just need to know where to find it. And I think that's the new ethos for education that we need to think about. Um, one final comment from Kevin Kelly here. I love this statement. How can technology make a person better? Only by providing everybody with chances. And that, for me, folks, is the essence of social media and mobile technology. That's why I'm so enthusiastic about them. That's why I'm so, I suppose, in love with these technologies, is because they do inspire us and they do help us with new chances which we never had before. Uh, there's my contact details. And thank you very much. I'm open for questions, I think. OK. So while waiting, uh, I just want to say thank you very much for actually taking the opportunity to be here. I can hear you. OK. Uh, actually, it be my first date with my wife. Um, it kind of turned out very bad. Well. <laughs> it out very well in the end. So I think this webinar is, is another case of it didn't start very well, but it actually, the session was actually a great session. We learned a lot. Discussing in the chat how many people have actually mobile devices link I can share again here it says this is from January or February this year it basically says that oh I don't have it here sorry I earlier but it's about 1 billion plus that has smartphones already and I think that's going to increase dramatically over the next decade so we probably have uh, and as uh, Harvard and MIT went through the edX they want to educate 1 billion people and so on I'm not sure whether they can do it but the, the technology is there the, the tools are there it's just a matter of how we can actually uh, maximize that and, and make an impact like Steve Wheeler took the opportunity to interact with us in Malaysia and actually we have audience from all over the world so uh, technology we can use and the, the biggest challenge now when I started off with e-learning in 2001 the biggest challenge was technology internet technology was slow and, and complicated but now the technology is easy the internet is there people are getting the devices is going back to the biggest issue our teachers hungry enough, our teachers willing to explore new, new ways of doing things, and that's the big, I feel that's the biggest challenge that we have today is, is, is the human aspect, not necessarily the technology and the internet in many places, except for uh, exceptional places. So any questions here? I will, I will shut up. We have any questions in the chat box? Can we just ask questions through the chat box? Yeah, so you've got invitation from Ghana now to conduct a session, huh? From Alexander. Alexander I'm Poo very happy I to do that with you. <laughs> Um, no, 80% of learning in informal is informal. How is that operationalized? Um, we don't know, I think, uh, is, is the answer to that. I think um, that people like Cross and Kofi and others have done the research on it, and, and th this has been known for quite some time that the majority of what we learn is outside of, of school and outside of um, university. Um, I don't know what you mean. I think I, I'm, I'm, I think I know what you mean by operationalized. I think, how is it applied? Well, it's applied through you know, our everyday lives, um, our own, just by working on Twitter and, and, um, and, and following links that people send me, and, and then writing on my blog and, and getting comments back from it, and, and um, considering 
perspectives I've never considered before. So that for me is one way, I suppose, my operation. And uh, also, um, I, I watched lots of television programs. Um, what you probably don't know is that um, I, I do a lot of cooking. I, I used to do a lot of cooking. When I get the time, I, I still cook for the family now, and I collaborate dishes because I, I watch how they're done on television. We've got lots of cookery programs here in the UK. Um, there's about a three-hour program, and it, it does loads of. They do loads of dishes live in the studio for you, and and, uh, and then I go off and I get the ingredients and I, and I try it for myself and refine those that art. So in fact, I'm teaching myself. Well, I'm learning myself. Um, so so that's another part of the 80 percent of my of my education. So I, I think uh, there are lots of different ways that we can we can learn from each other and from you know things like media and um, and. and newspapers and so on. Um, we're fighting the world around us uh, and a lot, a lot of the time we don't need school for that. I'm not saying we don't need school, but we don't need school for the informal stuff, obviously. Robert says, uh, let's just have a look here a second. Steve, what do you think? Uh, everybody, everyone's talking about individual learning, but with two to target and homo homogenic app designs and app solutions, how can this work together? The structure and design of apps are not individual in most of the cases. Yeah, and I think that's true. A lot of homogenization going on because of the economies of scale involved in, in production and so on. So lots of uh, um, technology companies do send out stuff which is identical. But within that, the software does allow you to tailor and, and um, individualize your, your you know, wrapper and so on. So people are understanding this. So, so I think companies like iPhone, you know, Apple iPhone, are, are actually providing um, you know, external you know, wrappers so that you can, you can you know, have different covers on them and so on. And, and so that's one form of personalization. But the software personalization, I think, is going to be an important thing. Um, there are lots of ways of tailoring or, or modifying um, certain social media sites, for instance. I, I remember um, Bebo. If anyone remembered Bebo? Blog early, but often I think it meant. And, and another one, uh, MySpace. Those, those ones, um, th those social media platforms, you were able to tailor your backgrounds and so on. The same with blogs these days. Lots of blogs look different to each other now because um, people have decided, you know, the, the, the look and feel they want for their blogs. So I think there is a lot of... Um, scope and, and, um, and opportunities for, for personalizing um, your tools. And, uh, but ultimately, they have to have a certain amount of homogeneity to them because they all do the same type of thing, just in different ways. So I think we're, we're walking a fine line there between personalization and homogenization. Anyone else? I'm bringing on. Anyone want to argue with me? No, I, yeah, there's somebody that wants to argue with you. That is me, you know. You wouldn't believe it. Actually, the well, light on in the roof on our ceiling went off also just now. Now, so it's just one of those amazing days. That's why my room's pretty dark. <laughs> I can see you in silhouette. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, look sticky. You can see a yeah, light there. See that? There's a special light there. Uh, it just went off. Yeah. It's just amazing. It's just a, one of those days. Okay, Farah asked the question there. What about integrating between different e-learning tools and techniques? Okay, argue with you. What about okay. Time? How how can we uh, facilitate learning without internet uh, using technology in efficient ways? Uh, where do they have internet and so on? Uh, yeah, do you have well, any ideas, uh, experiences, how they, for example, do do it? Yeah, Agrawal back in 1970 talked about um, satellite broadcasting, um, and he, um, he he set up uh, his company, I think, or his university set up um, the ability via satellite and, and radio. Um, broadcast through the satellite to actually train 100,000 teachers across the whole of India. Um, that's still possible to do. You know, we've still got we've got better satellite technology now than we did. We have much better ability to um, to use radio than we did then, and the same with television. You know, lots of people have television sets now, and if they don't, they they can have a radio. And you've even got the ability now in places where there's no um, electricity to to have wind-up radios. Uh, courtesy of a British inventor, um, and, and uh, uh, you know there are lots of ways of, of, of avoiding the internet, if you like, to actually still provide uh, mass forms of education for people, or even individualised forms of education. The Open University, until recently, in the UK, um, had predominantly paper-based provision delivery of, of its distance learning courses, and if you were a, a student of the Open University, you'd get a huge parcel through every month with reading material in it. It was all paper-based, you know. And I don't see any reason why that still shouldn't continue. It's still a very efficient method 
of education. So we don't have to have the web. It's just the web makes things so much easier. Okay, one more question. I noticed uh, from what I've seen is that when when e-learning is just content, uh, willing to explore it by themselves. But the moment you connect it with people, and you, that's one of the things that you notice that uh, the, the free courses now actually have real people, have a, a real uh, semester and so on. That seems to be so much more attractive. And you mm -hmm. get audiences like 160,000 students registering and so on. But when you had MIT Courseware, for example, yes, it was interesting, but you don't get that excitement there. It's just like content going through. So I, that need, do you think that yeah. needs to be more, more emphasized, the, the connectivity between expert and learner, learner and learner, besides learner and content? Well, the, those three methods are, you know, the, these are the three things that Michael Moore identified, you know, the, the, the three different types of interactions interaction as well, which was identified by Leslie Moore, so as a student to interface. And uh, you, you've got to consider yeah. that one as well, because that, that is a vital um, connectivity in, in these days with, with intuitive systems and with non-touch and touch technologies. They, that alone will motivate some students to learn more. Um, so four types of interaction. Now, a student to teacher, which is the, the traditional one, the Socratic one, if you like, then the, teen, then the student to content, and then the student. We've got to, we've got to consider four in that. And uh, within amongst that, I think MOOCs, massively online open courses, um, of which Stanford is probably the classic example of that. 160,000 students, I think, you know, Sebastian Thrun and uh, Peter Norvig recently um, with this MOOC. Um, um, the, the whole idea behind that was that it was part delivered and part um, individualized. So the students had to consume a certain amount of content, but then they had to go off and create their own content as well. Well, and this is the same thing that happens with a lot of other MOOCs, and that is the appeal to it, is, is the learning by doing as well as the learning by reflection. Um, so it's match the modes and media and the methods to actually create a conducive environment where exciting learning can take place. Um, I've been blogging recently about the nature of learning. In fact, if you look at my blog post from yesterday, it says, what is learning? And you know, I want reactions from people, so go onto my blog and, and preach into what is learning, that question. It's going to be different. It's as different as your fingerprints to mine. You know, we've all got different ideas about how learning takes place, what it is, what's the important, how to optimize it, and so on. Um, learning is different for everyone. We have different minds. But in amongst that, there are lots of commonalities that we can tap into, lots of different um, things which we all have in common, which I think um, if we can identify those and then operationalize them, as the, the guy said earlier on with, with his question, um, I, I think then we're, then we're going to see a shift in the way people learn, you know, a, a kind of an uptake in the way people learn, a, a paradigm shift, if you will. Um, it, we've, I think we've got to understand that there are lots of modes, methods, and media, and we, we've got to be able to offer all of them, and that's what MOOCs can do. Yeah, I was just mentioning one more that's very important in Asia, and that is student-parent or parent-student interaction. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I was just wondering, yeah. I, I'm attending just for fun. Uh, introduction to Sociology is one of these open courses. And they ask me to do the exam, which is normal. But interestingly, after the exam, uh, they ask me to, they give me a rubric and ask me to review five other exams so that I correct them. And they will not reveal my results until after I've corrected these five exams in a MOOC. Uh, what, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, we are learning in the process of correcting exams. But what do you think about these kind of strategies? Because some people might get a bit offended that, you know, uh, yeah, it's a free course for study asking you to correct the, your exams, you know. What do you think about these kind of strategies? I mean, from a learning, you learn from it, truly. But some people oh, yeah. might think, take it uh, differently. Sometimes you have to throw people into the deep end of the swimming pool at the risk of them drowning. You know, you have to scaffold that. You have to dip, dive in and save them if they're going to drown. But most people will actually learn to swim very quickly if they're in a... It's the same with any... Um, learning through adversity, I think. Learning through um, difficulty. Not all learning is joyful learning. Not all learning is fun. Some, and sometimes that's the, that's the learning that really is the deepest type of learning. Um, and if you're having to work hard, if you're having to think hard, and if it's... If it's really difficult stuff. Sometimes students do give up, but that's the risk we've got to take, take as creative um, um, educators, you know, is to provide the experience which, which will give them autonomy, give them agency to go off and choose the way they're going to go with it. Often, um, 
I don't answer my students' questions, and they get really annoyed with me. And they say, but you're the teacher, you're supposed to answer my I said, no, I'm not, I'm a teacher, but I'm not going to go away and find them for yourselves. And sometimes, but eventually they come back and they thank me for, for making them go off and find the questions, because they learned more that way. Um, and the same I set up my classes um, that I'm teaching at Plymouth University right now. What I do is I ask the students to go off and find the content themselves and bring it back. I ask them to formulate and then we make them very uncomfortable. And they have to defend themselves. They have to defend their opinions. They have to defend. And um, you know, this is all done with their license. This is done with their agreement when they first start the course. We call it bear pit pedagogy. It's like being in a bear pit sometimes. And people are kind of raising their voices and so on. But they've got to understand that you can have an argument with each other and then go off and have a drink afterwards together and still be friends. That's the whole point of critical thinking and learning, is that it's hard work sometimes. It's not easy. And we mustn't okay. make it easy. We're doing research in this area. This one, uh, basically the holy grail, I call it the holy grail, it's meant to say 150,000 with deep thinking and really critical, analytical writing and so on, is that how do you deal with the yeah. open-ended question? I mean, if you, if you have to do it manually, it's very difficult to, you, of course you can get the students. But I, I listened to one talk and they say they're doing research on, on having automated answering of the free response or the, the open-ended question. How far do, have they actually come in research that they can actually make it nearly as accurate or even better than, for example, 10 lectures correcting the same essay and getting a better average result? Have you, have you read about this? Is, is there any research going on very depth that has come to a certain stage? We're talking about hard AI here. We're talking about artificial intelligence. We're talking about machine read readable um, content here and that's a thing to achieve. It's past it, but I think it's a lot of it from, from um, action. Since it has to be done, if you've got it, um, so we practice in Plymouth what we call triadic learning or triadic assessment, shall I say, and, and um, that means that the student firstly uh, assesses their own work and they give themselves a grade on the same criteria that I assess them on. And then secondly, they get a peer to assess their work and on the same criteria. And thirdly, I assess it, and then we average the scores out. And it's interesting to note that um, when students assess their own work, they're quite harsh on themselves. They don't want to be seen to be awarding themselves points they don't deserve, because that will kind of damage the reputation. But then you've got um, peers who, who, um, who, who are less harsh on them, because they don't want to... Um, to, to lose their friends. And then you get us who seem to be in the middle. You know, you, we've done this time and time again, and, and, and it, you seem to get um, the tutors marking a lot more objectively, because often we don't know the students that well. And we've got no vested interest in any kind of emotional connections with them or relationships with them. And, and uh, um, so, but that form of triadic assessment actually provides, I think, a much more reliable overall assessment uh, regime, if you like, um, and it gives them the sense also, because my lab are training to be teachers, it's appropriate for them to do this because um, they have to learn to assess as well as learn to express themselves academically. Um, and, and there are all sorts of other methods of doing it as well. I, I, I think um, selecting students at random to assess each other's work, I think it could be quite an important uh, future for us. Okay. okay, we've been having our own chat here, but I think there's some questions going on in the chat box. I think we can, if it's okay, if we can continue another five minutes, are you fine with that? Yeah. Uh, let's see if that's Absolutely, there's yeah. I've got a meeting in about uh, 20 minutes, but that's okay. I can, let's go down a few. Okay, bye-bye. For informal learning, keen people are using mobiles in social media to learn, for example, like Steve said, you learn some recipe for cooking something for the family, but how about informal learning where teachers seem to avoid this because they are not familiar with it, and the students tend to separate? Social something or other, I think it says. Um, uh, let's just see if I can get that question back again. It's gone up, up, up the hill a little bit. But I, um, I, <laughs> teachers have to make decisions based on what they think is important for their students. And it's a wrong decision. They'll learn from it. But then so will the kids, or so will the students. Because um, if I give a good lecture or a good presentation like this, so I, you know, if maybe I hope, hope you think it's good, you're going to learn from it. If I give a bad presentation, you're also going to learn from it. You're going to learn what not to do. Um, <laughs> um, so students can't really lose um, because they'll go away and they'll find other ways to learn. Um, if you've got a bad teacher, I think that is a big problem. Uh, it's often been said that bad teachers in the classroom um, don't get any better when they're online. And in fact, if anything, the problems are amplified. They're made worse by online. <laughs> 
uh, presentations, and it's often the case. But um, and we should kind of get rid of bad teachers, get them out of the system. But but essentially, um, students, if they're motivated, they're they're going to learn. Whichever way uh, they're treated, and whichever way um, things happen to them, they will they will still continue to. Learn. I think we as teachers, we've just got to take the responsibility and, and have the kind of the 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 um, the ethos to. to to, to try and make the best possible environments for our students and to, to try and give them the best experiences, to either push them or, or, or pull them in the right direction so that they learn really deep stuff which has transferable skills throughout the rest of their lives. We're preparing people for the rest and that's why it's so important to be a good teacher. Okay, thank you very much. Basically, if we can inspire well, them, we can simplify it. Teachers making decisions based on their own teaching. Yeah, that, that's something we've got to break out of as well. I, I think um, we've got to challenge people and say, like, you may have been taught this by yourself, but, you know, you know, think about teaching in new ways. Be creative. Sorry, I talked earlier then, Zayn. I had to answer that question. <laughs> no problem. Is, 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 is that 20, uh, I've been teaching for 20 years, but uh, as I, I totally agree. I mean, I, to me personally, I think if you can simplify things, you challenge your students, but you simplify things and you you create those in interactive learning environments and, and and you kind of try to inspire them in any way. You be inspired yourself. I think students with all these tools and devices and communities, they can go really far. But if you if you what do you call a obsession with passing the exams and, and, and all this memorization stuff and so on, uh, they will probably hate school afterwards, you know. So in these days when we it's so important as Kurt Bonk, Kurt Bonk basically said, the 21st century is the learning century. And everybody's learning. Uh, the question is, uh, we as teachers or lecturers or educators or professionals, we have to be better than our students in learning. So at least we can teach besides uh, the knowledge itself. You know? So that's, that's really critical. I say thank you, thank you very much. I apologize for the last time. I'm sorry about the first interruptions. I missed the session. The session is recorded. And it, it turned out really great, and I'm very happy that you were very patient. Uh, but I anticipate, I saw actually a lecture of you today, one hour from one of your conferences, uh, your keynote session. So I, Did you? I just want to say thank you very much. And you can, yeah, just to get the feel of your, the way of your presentation and so on, and the way you talk and so on. So it's very interesting. Thank Definitely you very much. And uh, we really appreciate it. And I believe you have got some more fans here. You got at least one super fan from Ghana. So you might have to go there physically also maybe one day and help out <laughs> increase your 20 countries of uh, keynotes and so on. Uh, so again, when you feel like it. So thank you, thank you very much and I'll keep in touch. And please share your slides. I'll make your slides available on the blog post. And when I've, uh, we will post it on YouTube also. When we post on YouTube, I will actually inform you. And thank you, thank you very much again.